Do we have a All right, hand it over to Edwin for our next small talk. All right. Where's the mic? Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, it's right there. Yes. There we go. All right, All right everyone. I'm Edwin. I'm one of the interns. I'm here to talk about uh, UIC DK, so kind of piggybacking off some of the hypo, uh, the diabetes talks that we've been having with Dr. Green. Um, so to begin with, um, just starting with a quick overview. Um, the definition of euglycemic DK normally, um, it's pretty simple. It's in the name just says with diabetic ketoacidosis, as we're aware. Um, with DK, we're usually seeing hyperglycemia with glucose greater than 200, um, as well as the presence of uh, the urine or serum ketones, the presence of a metabolic acidosis, um, and the presence of an anion gap. However, with euglycemic DK, as in the uh, graphic here, they're going to have um, the exception of now having essentially euglycemia, or sometimes sugars below 200, or sometimes very just mildly elevated um, sugars. Um, now, euglycemic DK is a rare entity. Um, it usually occurs in patients with type 1 diabetes, but it can also occur in patients with type 2 diabetes. Um, and really, the attention around euglycemic DK began around 2015 when the FDA um, issued this drug safety um, kind of warning um, regarding 20 cases that kind of came up of euglycemic DK in association with uh, SGLT2 inhibitors, which I'll talk about a little bit in more detail. Um, this was followed up by a European um, a report as well, which showed another 101 cases. And since then, there's been some case reports of euglycemic DK, even in the absence of SGLT2 inhibitors. So it's that it is a rare entity, but it is something that I think, especially in the emergency room, we might um, encounter. Um, it's something to keep aware of because uh, it's easily um, can you easily be missed and it has a dire consequence if it is. Um, so to be, in order to discuss euglycemic DK, we really have to delve deeper into the role of uh, SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, so SGLT2 inhibitors <laughs> include the flozins, right? So these are, uh, they include ipragliflozin, uh, ipragliflozin, and a bunch of other different types of medicines that end in the, in the suffix flozin. Um, they are approved for type 2 diabetics, and they're also used um, off-label for type 1 diabetics. They're becoming more um, popular now um, as well because of the added benefits of weight loss, um, fewer hypoglycemic events associated with them. And so you, we might start to see them um, in our populations a lot more. The mechanism of action of SGLT2s is pretty also uh, straightforward in terms of uh, it's pretty much like DK is in the name. Um, they work by inhibiting the SGLT2 transporter that's present in the proximal renal tubule. Um, in the kidney, that's where 90% of our um, glucose is reabsorbed from the urine. Um, and essentially, by inhibiting uh, the SGLT2s, uh, they're preventing glucose from being reabsorbed and allowing for an increased excretion of glucose, therefore uh, decreasing glucose levels in, um, independently of a patient's insulin um, status. Um, and essentially having glucosuria as a result. Um, now, to dive deeper into how the actual um, pathophysiology of euglycemic DK occurs, we do have to kind of go back to a little bit of basic uh, biochemistry. And I know when people see the Krebs cycle, you know, they tend to feel like this. I know I definitely remember during med school having to uh, remember all the different steps of the Krebs cycle, but we we're not going to go too far into it, but it is important to know some of the basic steps to understand how euglycemic DK can occur. Um, so, essentially, with the use of SGLT2s, um, in causing increased glucosuria, they're going to lead to a decrease um, in insulin uh, as well. The decrease in insulin is going to then lead to a series of, of events that will eventually lead to increase in free fatty acid, uh, increase in free fatty acid, increase in lipolysis, and then eventually um, an increase in beta oxidation that leads to the ketogenesis that can cause um, uh, ketoacidosis. Um, as you see here in this graphic, it kind of creates this um, chain of events where with the, with the increase of this ketogenesis, the patient will also then start to become symptomatic. We'll also probably have associated decreased carbohydrate intake, nausea, vomiting, which will then just keep um, exacerbating um, the decrease in glucose and the decrease in insulin and eventually lead to severe DKA. Um, however, obviously, because there's the decrease of insulin, you're also going to see that the blood glucose will also um, won't necessarily jump to uh, become high levels as we would expect it. 
Now to go a little bit deeper as well into how insulin does this, um, insulin itself, um, by decreasing the level of insulin, it's gonna essentially decrease um, the acetyl-CoA carboxylase. And acetyl-CoA carboxylase in turn causes a decreased activation of molynyl-CoA. Now molynyl-CoA normally, its normal function works to inhibit um, the CPT1 or this carnitine uh, farm oil transferase. Um, that is a big uh, enzyme involved in essentially beta oxidation, which is what leads to, keto, um, to ketone production. Um, so with decreased insulin, we're gonna have essentially decreased inhibition of carnitine uh, palm oil transferase, which will essentially lead to an increase in beta oxidation and an increase in ketogenesis. And that's kind of the basic framework as to how this eventually leads to um, ketoacidosis. Additionally, um, the SGLT2 inhibitors will also lead to an increase in glucagon. And the increase in glucagon pretty much works the same way um, and exacerbates what the decrease in insulin does and will also lead to a, a similar decrease in acetyl-CoA carboxylase activation, which will eventually lead to an increase um, of this CPT1, which will lead to an increase in beta oxidation. Um, all of this essentially just to say that with the, the use of SGLT2 inhibitors, there is a higher chance that um, we're gonna lead to higher ketone production, however, with the glucose remaining low. And that's kind of the main point um, to remember from this talk. Um, in terms of risk factors for your glycemic decay, it's gonna be very similar to um, just regular decay, right? So any other concurrent illnesses the patient might have, if they've had uh, recently, um, if they have a history of alcohol abuse, reduced fluid or food intake for some reason, um, patients who are both on insulin and SGLT2s are also at risk. Um, and then it's also important to keep an eye out for on type 1 diabetics. Essentially, the reason for this is because type 1 diabetics will tend to have, um, especially early on in their course, will tend to have uh, an increased GFR. And so SGLT2s will actually have a more potent effect because not their kidneys are able to actually really excrete a lot of that glucose and can lead them into this path. Um, additionally, insulin can also um, enhance the effect of that SGLT2 inhibition on glucosuria. And so since a lot of type 1 diabetics can also be on insulin, that's also important to know. Um, and then um, insulin changes are less frequent in type 1 diabetics as well. So it's important to just keep this in mind whenever you see a patient coming to the ED who can be a type 1 diabetic, and especially if, they're say, if they say that they're on um, some sort of flows in, um, and are starting to present with some symptoms that you're considering DK on them. So to summarize, we just some take home points. I think the really uh, the big thing, the biggest take home point is um, definitely don't rely on just blood glucose alone, especially if you have a high clinical suspicion that this patient might be in DK, right? But if it's a young 20 something year old who's coming in with type one diabetes, who's coming in with nausea, vomiting, inability to tolerate PO, might be appearing a little altered, um, but you know, and they have, they might have some sort of small metabolic acidosis, but your their sugars in the 100s. It's still important, I think, to um, definitely try to rule out DK in these patients, especially if they also have um, SGLT2 inhibitors on board, um, which is my next take home point, right? Always consider you guys doing DK in these patients. It's not necessarily always going to be the case, but it's just something to add on to the differential um, when you're uh, examining a patient with presenting with these symptoms. Additionally, in these patients, it's important to obtain the urine or the serum ketones, right? So sending that beta hydroxybutyrate or, or looking at the urine ketones just to make sure that this patient isn't in floor DKA. Um, and then the, the last thing to know is that essentially the treatment is still going to be the same. So no matter if it's euglycemic or hyperglycemic, we're still going to treat them with fluids. We're still going to treat them with IV insulin, uh, potassium repletion as needed. Um, and the, um, the goal is to close the gap and um, eventually transition them to the oral uh, insulin. Um, so all in, uh, overall, I think um, the base thing, uh, just to keep in mind, is just this is something that could be missed, um, but if we have this in our mind and in our differential, hopefully um, we'll always think about it when we see a patient like this. That's my references, and I'm done. Any questions, comments? I think the big point, like Amrap just had one about this, and with the DK, with these euglycemics, their hypoglycemia rates are higher. So just really starting them on that D5 mm -hmm. sooner than like our other DKs, obviously. Yeah, um, yeah, I've had one of these at downstate, and exactly right. They're a little more complicated and tougher front. You kind of have to do a lot more of that, like tweaking uh, in ED, whereas usually that happens in the big cube for like the hypoglycemic DK patients. Any other questions, comments? Good job, Evan. Thank you.
Uh, let's take a five minute break uh, and then we'll transition to our senior lectures. Thank <laughs> you. 